I am a ridiculous person. Now they call me a madman. That would be a promotion if it weren't that I remain as ridiculous in their eyes as before. But now I do not resent it. They are all dear to me now, even when they laugh at me, and indeed it's just then that they are particularly dear to me. I could join in their laughter, not exactly at myself, but through affection for them, if I didn't feel so sad as I look at them. Sad because they do not know the truth, and I do. How hard it is to be the only one who knows the truth, but they won't understand that. No, they will not understand. In old days I used to be miserable at seeming ridiculous. Not seeming, but being ridiculous. I've always been ridiculous, and I have known it, perhaps from the hour I was born. Perhaps from the time I was seven years old, I knew I was ridiculous. So that it seemed in the end, as though all the science I studied at the university existed only to prove and make evident to me, as I went more deeply into them, that I was ridiculous. It was the same with life as it was with science. With every year the same consciousness of the ridiculous figure I cut in every relation grew and strengthened. Everyone always laughed at me, but not one of them knew or guessed that if it were one man on earth who knew better than anybody else that I was absurd, it was myself. And what I resented most of all was that they did not know that. But that was my own fault. I was so proud that nothing would have ever induced me to tell it to anyone. This pride grew in me with the years, and if it had happened that I allowed myself to confess to anyone that I was ridiculous, I believe that I should have blown out my brains the same evening. Oh, how I suffered in my early youth from the fear that I might give way and confess it to my schoolfellows. But since I grew to manhood, I have for some unknown reason become calmer, though I realized my awful characteristic more fully every year. I say unknown, for to this day I cannot tell why it was. Perhaps it was owing to the terrible misery that was growing in my soul through something which was of more consequence than anything else about me that something was the conviction that had come upon me that nothing in the world mattered. I had long had an inkling of it, but the full realization came last year almost suddenly. I suddenly felt that it was all the same to me whether the world existed or that well, there had never been anything at all, I began to feel with all my being that there was nothing existing. At first I fancied that many things had existed in the past, but afterwards I guessed that there never had been anything in the past either, but that it had only seemed so for some reason. Little by little I guessed that there would be nothing in the future either. Then I left off being angry with people and almost ceased to notice them. Indeed, this showed itself even in the piteous trifles. I used, for instance, to knock against people in the street and not so much from being lost in thought, what had I to think about? 
I'd almost given up thinking by that time nothing mattered to me. If at least I had solved my problems. Oh, I had not settled one of them, and how many there were. But I gave up caring about anything, and all the problems disappeared. And it was after that that I found out the truth. I learned the truth last November, and the 3rd of November to be precise, and I remember every instance since. It was a gloomy evening, one of the gloomiest possible evenings. I was going home at about 11 o'clock, and I remember that I thought that the evening could not be gloomier. Even physically, rain had been falling all day, and it had been a cold, gloomy, almost menacing rain with, I remember, an unmistakable spite against mankind. Suddenly, between 10 and 11, it had stopped and was followed by a horrible dampness, colder and dampener than the rain, and a sort of steam was rising from everything, from every stone in this street, and from every by-lane, if one looked down as far as one could. A thought suddenly occurred to me, that if all the street lamps had been put out, it would have been less cheerless than the gas made one's heart sadder because it lighted it all up. I had had scarcely any dinner that day, and had been spending the evening with an engineer and two other friends had been there also. I sat silent, I fancy I bored them. They talked of something rousing and suddenly they got excited over it. But they didn't really care, I could see that, and only made a show of being excited. I suddenly said as much to them, my friends, I said, you really don't care one way or the other. They were not offended, but they laughed at me, that was because I spoke without any of reproach, simply because it did not matter to me, they, so it did not, and it amused them. As I was thinking about the gas lamps in the street, I looked up at the sky. The sky was horribly dark, but... One could distinctly see ladders' clouds and between them fathomless black patches. Suddenly I noticed in one of these patches a star. I began watching it intently. That was because that star had given me an idea. I decided to kill myself that night. I had firmly determined to do so two months before and as poor as I was, I bought a splendid revolver that very day and loaded it. But two months had passed and it was still lying in my drawer. I was so utterly indifferent that I wanted to seize the moment when I would not be so indifferent. Why? I don't know. And so for two months every night that I came home, I thought I would shoot myself. I kept waiting for the right moment. And so now the star gave me a thought. I made up my mind that it should certainly be that night. And why the star gave me the thought, I don't know. And just as I was looking at the sky, this little girl took me by the elbow. The street was empty and there was scarcely anyone to be seen. A cabman was sleeping in the distance in his cab. It was a child of eight with a kerchief on her head, wearing nothing but a wretched little dress, all soaked with rain, but I noticed her wet broken shoes and I recall them now. They caught my eye, particularly. She suddenly pulled me by the elbow and she called me. 
She was not weeping, but was spasmodically crying out some words which she could not utter properly, because she was shivering and shuddering all over. She was in terror about something and kept crying, Mommy, Mommy. I turned facing her and I did not say a word and went on. But she ran pulling at me and there was that note in her voice which in frightened children means despair. I know that sound, though she did not articulate the words I understood that her mother was dying or that something of the sort was happening to them and that she had run out to call someone to find something to help her mother. I did not go with her and the contrary I had an impulse to drive her away. I told her first to go to policeman but clasping her hands she ran beside me sobbing and gasping and would not leave. Then I stamped my foot and shouted at her. She called out, Sir, sir, but suddenly abandoned me and rushed headlong across the road. Some other passerby appeared there, and she evidently flew from me to him. I mounted up to my fifth story. I have a room in flat where there are other lodgers. My room is small and poor with a garret window in the shape of a semicircle. I have a sofa covered with American leather, a table with books on it, two chairs and a comfortable armchair, as old as old can be, but of the good old-fashioned shape. I sat down, lighted the candle and began thinking. In the room next to mine, through the partition wall, a perfect bedlam was going on. It had been going on for the last three days. A retired captain lived there, and he had half a dozen visitors, gentlemen of doubtful reputation, drinking vodka and playing straws with old cards. The night before there had been a fight, and I know that two of them had been for a long time engaged in dragging each other about by the hair. The landlady wanted to complain, but she was in an abject terror of the captain. There was only one other lodger in the flat. A thin little regimental lady on a visit to Petersburg with uh, three little children who had been taken ill since they came into the lodgings. Both she and her children were in mortal fear of the captain and lay trembling and crossing themselves all night, and the youngest child had a sort of fit from fright. The captain, I know for a fact, sometimes stops people in the Nevsky prospect and begs. They won't take him into the service, but strange to say, that's why I am telling this, all this month that the captain has been here his behavior has caused me no annoyance. I have, of course, tried to avoid his acquaintance from the very beginning, and he too was bored with me from the first, but I never care how much they shout the other side of the partition, nor how many of them there are in there. I sit up all night and forget them so completely that I don't even hear them. I stay awake till daybreak, and have been going on like that for the last year. I sit up all night in my armchair at the table doing nothing. I only read by day. I sit, don't even think, ideas of a sort wander through my mind, and I let them come and go as I will. A whole candle is burnt every night. I sat down quietly at the table, took out the revolver and put it down before me. When I had put it down, I asked myself, I remember, is that so? And answered with complete conviction it is. That is, I shall shoot myself. I knew that I should shoot myself that night for certain, but how much longer I should go on sitting at the table I didn't know, and no doubt I should have shot myself if it had not been for that little girl.